working with with a more coaching approach to developing people. You may not have to do so much recruitment. Business of Architecture UK, episode 41. Special announcement, the next BOA UK live event, the first one of 2019, is coming to you on Tuesday, the 5th of March. It will be held in the UNI offices, 7A Howick Place in Victoria, Southwest London, and there will be a discussion panel of industry thought leaders, in entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, architects, discussing the seven threats to an architectural practice. Now, early bird tickets are now on sale. I'm going to put the link and the information uh, underneath this podcast. So book your tickets right away, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hello, and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm in my favourite hotel on the Thames. It was a grisly, overcast day, but I had the fantastic opportunity of speaking with Rachel Birchmore and Louise Rogers about the topic of emotional intelligence. There's a little bit bit of background on both of these uh, extraordinary women. Um, Rachel is an experienced strategic marketing consultant and she's been trained in business, personal and leadership coaching. And about six years ago, she set up a company called RB. Um, and she's got a lot of operational director experience um, before that, and she combines her coaching abilities with her marketing strategies and expertise and works primarily with a number of architects. Now, Louise is also a business coach. She's an executive and business coach. She's got about 25 years of experience in public relations and communications. She was one of the founding directors of Niche PR, um, who are a company that works across a number of sectors from real estate, hospitality, um, and design. Uh, And she exited that around 2014. And together, they've created Step Up, which is a new coaching program, which is focused for associates and associate directors within architects practices and other organizations in the built environment. So they've got a real deep understanding of the industry and how it operates. And they have, they focus their work on emotional intelligence. And for me, and I've sort of alluded to this before in many podcasts about the importance of emotional intelligence, because it really is the underlying driver for every single decision that we make and every part of our business is impacted and affected by our level of emotional intelligence from how we hire staff to how we cultivate our teams how we lead how we lead ourselves the decisions that we make the things that we do the things that we don't do our productivity Um, And of course, emotional intelligence in sales and in marketing, having a deep level of uh, emotional understanding of somebody else's perspective and also the underlying emotional forces which are, you know, at play within our own identities is a very, very deep conversation. And having uh, a good understanding and grasp of it can really transform our businesses and take them into totally new uncharted areas and can be very very exciting so i'm going to leave you now but please enjoy this fantastic podcast it's filled with fascinating um bits with um, Rachel Birchmore and Louise Rogers. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am here with Rachel Birchmore and Louise Rogers. Pleasure to to have you here. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yep. Nice to be here. Brilliant. So we're here because we're going to talk about emotional intelligence and how that is important in the realm of architecture and architecture business. So the first question is, what, where, where, what, what is it that you guys do? What are your backgrounds? Um, okay. So, well, I'm Rachel and my back, I'm a consultant and I'm a coach. And my background, I've spent 25 years working with people in the built environment, um, initially with a project manager doing business development and marketing, and that's my background. 
And then five years ago, I left there and set up my own business, which is RB, um, spelled A-R-E-B-E. It's important, doesn't work on a podcast. <laughs> um, and that business advises primarily architects, but actually consultants all the way across the built environment on marketing, strategy, business development. Um, and then later, so three years ago now, I trained as a coach um, and as a sort of adjunct to that business so that training gives me the ability to do one-to-one -one coaching with people whether that be around leadership or business development um, but it also gives a slightly different style to what I'm doing in terms of my consultancy work so yeah that's my background and Louise well my background is actually in public relations I trained originally as a journalist and then I worked in PR um, mostly with uh, organizations working in the built environment for 25 years, including being a co-founder um, of an agency, a PR agency that specialized in working um, with stakeholder communications. So doing um, really complex negotiations with local communities around developments that are planned for their area. So through that, I obviously met a lot of developers and architects and, and um, I suppose some of my job was distilling their very complex messages into bite-sized chunks that could be um, that could be understood by local communities impacted by development to help people get planning consent. And I left um, my business five years ago, and then I trained as a coach. Right. So both of you have got the, the the background in 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 business coaching. Yeah. And so the topic for this afternoon is emotional intelligence. So what is it? What is emotional intelligence? Well, it's one of those things, isn't it, that gets associated perhaps because it's got the word emotion in it mm. with the kind of the soft skills that people need in order to run a business. And both Rachel and I feel that that is kind of underselling it. And I think what we would say is that um, it's about the things that make us human. Rachel, would you like to add to that? <laughs> Just really weird, because it's one of those things that to define is really... I think, I mean, well, let's, there's two things. There's an official definition of emotional intelligence, which let's say it anyway, because I think it's important. So emotional intelligence is being able to recognize your own emotions, right. recognizing those of others, being able to regulate your own emotional responses, um, and being able to influence others. Which again, that word emotion, I think it really does undermine what it actually is because it is actually, if you take away um, that emotion, you basically end up with a machine. Mm. So the machine that has technical expertise um, and an intellectual capacity for facts and information and technical things, but you take away everybody's thinking and beliefs and values and personality and all those things that actually make us human. Um, and particularly when you're um, working on project, you know, building projects, there are masses of people involved with those. So the process of designing and making buildings involves so many people and therefore so much emotion and mm. personality. Obviously, it's then crucial to I that. I, I suppose it's a, it's a kind <clears throat> of illusion that we think that emotions are something separate from our decision making exactly and that we think that we're exactly. kind of intellectually you know we know we know we're skilled professionals we don't need to worry about emotions emotions are for at home or somewhere else mm. but actually it's something that's driving us all the time exactly and, exactly and so yeah. what and so what are the kind of problems that that you've experienced with architects with not or not having emotional intelligence or where does emotional intelligence or a lack of training in it cause problems? Well, I wouldn't say that architects are particularly not emotionally intelligent. Um, but what Rachel and I have both found in our work with architects is quite often the people at the very senior level um, have the same sort of comments about the people the level below them um, that we feel comes down to... Um, a need to see the development of emotional intelligence take place. So, for example, they say, I sent them on a business development course, but they still don't go out and do new business. Mm. Or I sent them on a networking course, and they still don't come back, or they still don't want to go out and do networking. Because what they've done is they've given them a kind of layer of techniques and skills and tools that they may 
be able to use. But what they haven't done is actually increase their ability to use those effectively because we don't know what might be holding people back from until, you know, until people understand that for themselves, they may not know what's holding them back from, from being able to use those skills and techniques that they've been taught. Mm. So um, what, what we've done is develop a program for um, mostly associate level that will enable them to step up into a leadership role by building on their ability to understand their own emotional responses and understand the emotional responses that other people that they're working with might have and learning how to recognize what's happening kind of name it in order to tame it if you like the things that might trigger certain impulses in them and then work with those so that they become more effective across the board so what what kind of obstacles if you're you know can a training in emotional intelligence un unlock if you like in an architecture practice so that's a that's a good example where you're saying that an architect might be giving training development to some of their staff and then yet they're not implementing the techniques and the skills and obviously that's quite a that's quite a massive one and it's, well it, just to give you a small example as rachel has said more and more people are working um, in really big project teams and an awful lot about emotional intelligence, it's, it's, it's words that are used to describe building better relationships with people. Mm. So, you know, as, as the public relations consultant or the public consultation consultant, I've been in those team meetings. And there is always an opportunity before that meeting starts to engage with the person sitting to your right or to your left who might be a quantity surveyor or somebody from the development company or, you know, somebody else involved in delivering a project but you'd be surprised how many people will not take that opportunity to engage. They sit there and they look at their emails and yet the person they're sitting next to could be their client of the future. And it's very simple things like that. Mm. It's, about, it's about waking up their curiosity about other people and making them feel more comfortable about that level of engagement with other people. Mm. I think... Um, one of the other areas that I see a lot, certainly when I do business development sort of coaching and advice, is around things like bidding for work. So one of the big areas around emotional intelligence is empathy. So being able to um, see things from somebody else's point of view. And obviously when you're initially doing networking, but particularly when you come to actually pitch for a project, the ability to see that project and the need from the client's point of view is absolutely paramount. And quite often when people are putting together a pitch, they can only actually see their own service and the things that they need to get across about their practice rather than actually stepping out of that and coming at it from um, the client's point of view. And that is so important. You see people bidding, you see people who win. It is really when they've demonstrated that understanding. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, that's, that's something that's key in sales and marketing. Sure. The more that you're yeah. able to communicate an understanding of what the client's genuine problem is and articulate it, uh, you've got a way higher chance of being able to win that work and also create an effective relationship because you're in the listening of the other person. That's right. And obviously, as somebody who has spent a large part of their working life working, um, with local communities to mm. explain the complications around planning applications. I was telling Rachel earlier that I did once sit in on a public consultation um, really early on in my career, and I think architects have got a lot better since, since then, um, with an architect who was trying to explain proposals for a very large social housing development. And there was somebody in the room who said, will I be able to hear my neighbor's toilet flush? And uh, the architect just carried on explaining what he wanted to explain. And the person said, I, I want to know, will I be able to hear my neighbor's toilet flush? And in the end, he actually stood up and repeated the question for the third time before he got, and then, we, and then he got some really complex explanation about soundproofing standards. Um, and it's really, I mean, as I say, I think this was a long time ago, and I think things have improved since then. But it really is about that ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see things from their point of view. Mm. And we're lucky in that that's something that we can learn to do better. Mm. We can all learn to do it, but we can't all learn how to be architects, but we can all learn how to do that better. Do you think there's a, a stigma almost about learning about these types of skill sets and emotional intelligence? Because you're saying that the word emotional kind of yeah. suddenly people go in a particular direction yeah. with it. And I'm, you know, I'm very much like you that this, this work on emotional EQ is the root of absolutely 
every interaction that we have as human beings. Yes. I think, yeah, I think traditionally that has certainly been the case. There's um, people see technical expertise as more important than what's been called in the past soft stuff, mm. you know, the really difficult soft stuff. Um, I think I do think that's changing. You can see in the new, as Louis said earlier on, in the new breed of architects, those sort of practices who are starting to be at the forefront of things now are led by people who have very high levels of emotional intelligence. So I think there is a change. And it's perhaps because to be successful now on the larger projects, as we've talked about, you do actually need to have that. So maybe it's naturally um, becoming that way. Can you, can you walk me through a, a sort of process that you might do with a client or an architect that might come to you and perhaps they've identified, I mean, even just being able to identify where there is a perhaps uh, a lack of understanding yeah. is, is a huge accomplishment in itself. Yeah. Um, what, um, what, what is it that you do and, then, and how do you help them identify those types of things? Well, I think there's a... There's obviously lots of different areas of emotional intelligence, but if we talk about one that comes up frequently, if you talk about triggers, mm. um, so we all have buttons which can be pressed by certain people and certain circumstances, even certain words, um, and the emotional intelligence enables you to deal with those triggers or buttons in a slightly different way. So I was saying to Louise earlier on, I read something yesterday that said you can't stop the bird landing on your head, but you can stop it building a nest. <laughs> but I'm not sure the bird lands on your head a lot, but I kind of get the essence of what they're trying to explain there. So um, with triggers, you would ask a client to work out... To, either by journaling or just by thinking about the last time that somebody pressed a button. Um, and it's really about trying to remember back to the earliest feeling or um, reaction that somebody had to that. So is it that your stomach tenses up at that point? Is it that your chest goes really tight? Is it that something that your head starts burning? Or, but generally, you can work out the very first stage of an emotional reaction by going, you can work out what the first part was. And it wasn't the point at which you threw something across the table and got very angry. It was probably five minutes earlier. It was a word that you heard or something happened. And if people can better understand um, those triggers, then they can start working out what it is about that word um, that makes them react in that way. And generally, there's something in between the trigger, so the word, and the reaction, which is generally a belief about something. So it might, for instance, I was in a meeting the other day and the, the, it ended in an argument between two people in the room. And it was brought about by the belief that one person felt that the other person didn't trust them. Now that was never actually stated, mm. but one person said something, the other reacted very defensively. So there was a trigger, there was a reaction, but the bit that was unspoken and unseen was the belief that they're not trusted. And that's actually what somebody reacts to. So if you can identify those beliefs, then you can start to actually address, address them. And something that is just so simple, which is learning how to listen better. I mean, most people don't listen very well. And it's a fundamental, obviously, of coach training. But most people listen in order to respond. And somebody can be talking to you and in your head, you're already formulating your response, which mm. means that you're not actually listening to them. You're not listening with your whole self. So I think even by learning, by, by, by working with people to increase their ability to really listen. And I've done that with people in groups where you get one person to talk for three minutes and the other person's not allowed to interrupt and not allowed to ask a question. Actually, when we were training, we did it for five, which I, with, with people who aren't training to be a coach, I would only do it for three because it's actually incredibly difficult to just sit and listen to somebody for three minutes mm. um, without working out what you're going to say. If you, if you, there's no pressure on you to say anything. In fact, you, you don't, you're really not allowed to say anything. Mm. Uh, and even practicing that can mean that people get the habit of not listening in order to respond but listening in order to listen. And you can imagine how that plays out in an architect's life with, with their colleagues, with clients. You know, if, if, if you present a proposal to a client and the client comes straight back at you with a criticism, rather than letting all those triggers be pushed 
and leaping to a response. Listen to what your client's saying and the way that they're saying it. Look, look for those verbal and physical cues that they give, that there may be something else that's happening in there, you know, that, that you're feeling, mm. um, but is actually probably not to do with you. But at least hear them out and then think carefully about how you're going to respond to them rather than immediately going on the defensive, which I think happens quite a lot. Yeah. And it's, and it's kind of, they're linked, aren't they, I suppose, with the, the, the reaction. If you go straight into a reaction mode and you're not aware that you've gone into a reaction mode, you're going to be listening to the other person in a certain, in a certain way, which has got nothing to do with that person. It's to do with you and, exactly. how, and the filters that you've just, yeah. you've, just, you've just basically condemned that person to your way of, of listening yeah. to them about. Yeah. Well, it used to happen an awful lot in public consultations. Yeah. Uh, and I can remember once being asked to um, kind of rescue a public consultation that had gone really badly wrong. So we were pulled in far too late because they'd decided that they could do it. The architects and the developers decided they could do it themselves. And I went to this um, public exhibition in a, in a London borough and I was, uh, and there was somebody who was standing looking at a display board and, you know, with the plans all nicely outlined. And I said to him, can I answer any questions that you might have about what's, what you're seeing on the boards? And he said, um, if I talk to you, I'm going to completely lose it. So I just need to stand here and absorb the information on the boards. And then we'll see. And so I knew to step back. And I knew that I was going to be dealing with somebody who... And, and when I did speak to him afterwards, he said, nobody has listened. This is the se second public exhibition we've had. Nothing's changed. Nobody has listened to us. So, you know, if you're going to actually do something like a public consultation, then develop your listening skills mm. so that you can listen and respond appropriately. It's, it's, it's very interesting because it's, again, that, that skill of listening is so key to every part of the design process. And, and I know for architects, you know, if you've negotiated a poor contract or you've got yourself into a little bit of a, a difficult situation, it's normally come down to both parties not listening to each other. Yeah. And in those first initial meetings as well, as part of like the sales process, it's, it's kind of so important for you as the architect to understand what the emotional drivers are. Exactly. To what the project, why the project is happening. Yeah. And it's often very interesting to, to try and to dig and, and to also, I suppose it takes a lot of confidence as well to be able to ask questions that elicit certain types of responses. Well, it does. And, you know, obviously... It's trained coaches that's one of the things that we do but but actually you know when I'm describing what coaching is to people I often say a coach will be your thinking partner will help you think because we believe that you have the solutions in your head and our job is to help bring them out and I think sometimes an architect working with a client is the same sort of relationship isn't it that you've got to be thinking partners you can't have two people coming in with completely separate agendas mm. you've got to have the ability to empathize with the other person kind of walk in their shoes for a while understand their point of view and it is all about kind of basic relationship building mm. yeah I think there you were going down the route of good questioning and I think people don't sometimes ask enough questions to try and understand a bit more I think sometimes we hear something which resonates with us and we almost go off down that tangent rather than listening to that and then going back with another question about the same topic and stopping us at another one of those triggers stopping ourselves going off down the tangent so yeah great question yeah no I, I'm, yeah. I've, I've you know I've had that uh, issue myself in, in conversations with clients where I've been held back and been like, actually, I shouldn't ask that. It's not my, it's not my business. And then actually through external, you know, training and development, mm. been able to, you know, go, well, actually, no, no, you can't, you can ask these questions. And it makes a big, big difference when mm. you start probing and asking questions that you thought perhaps were too personal, but actually it creates a very different relationship in a very different space. Mm. Well, people are different, aren't they, obviously? Mm. So the early relationship building, the better you've listened um, and the more you've watched those facial cues and that sort of thing, the more you should know then about how far you can push your questioning. Yes. Because if that early relationship building bit hasn't been done very effectively, you might well get it wrong. Mm. And we've all seen that. You know, I've certainly done that myself where you haven't quite got it right and you think, oh, no, that's too far or didn't go far enough. Yeah. So, so when, when architects mm. engage with your, your services and your, your coaching, what are they coming to you with? Um, all sorts of different things. I mean, on, so one-to-one -one coaching, I 
do, and I know Louise does similar, um, lots around people stepping into new roles. So new directors, um, people about to be promoted, um, people who are maybe stuck in a rut, who are either looking to leave the practice or trying to find a way to refresh what they're doing. Hmm. So um, want that promotion, don't understand why they're not getting it, but actually think it's something to do with them, not just the practice. So they're looking for help with that. Um, and then lots around business specifics around business development and networking. Um, I mean, I personally do a lot of work with introverts who want to network better, right? Uh, which is fascinating as, can, a, can as an little, area. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, is that is that common within architects? Then that, uh, there's a lot of I suppose it's a quite introverted. I think it's profession. common. Full stop. Right. Um, but yes, lots of architects and engineers are deep thinkers and full of technical expertise and fantastic at that. And lots of them. Um, are better within a smaller group than a great big dry event. Plus, it's full of people that they're not particularly interested in sometimes or perceive they might not be. So they're looking for different ways to do it. And I think the term networking um, in lots of people's heads sort of says big event full of old men in suits. And that's all they actually understand to be networking. Well, it's just not like that. You know, there's lots of ways to form connections and build relationships which is actually that all networking is about which doesn't involve going to great big events at all if you can put a bit more purpose to it and work out who it is you actually want to speak to it's perfectly possible to find ways of doing that that really suits you and your personality and mm. um, yeah no need for big events could you give us an example of, of alternative ways of of networking that might be uh, more well the obvious one is cycling Really? Um, which has overtaken our industry, I think, and lots of, well, yeah, it's the cycling's the new golf, isn't it? Which has become the cliche, I think. But obviously smaller groups um, around people's interests, so it doesn't need to be cycling. It could be a particular artist who's exhibiting somewhere who you know a couple of your potential clients are interested in. Well, why not go there? Mm. And because you're going to be more engaged with it, it's your area of interest it shows you've listened to that client and that's actually the person you need to meet you don't need to meet the 250 people in that dry event up the up the road so i think it almost sounds like fun as well but exactly <laughs> so well it can be yeah i mean you i suppose we all need to go to events that we don't particularly want to go to sometimes because our interests aren't the same as our clients but generally i think there are ways of doing it which suit people's personality better yeah. Well, I've worked um, with practice leaders mostly uh, and creative leaders of entrepreneurial companies generally. And I suppose what they all have in common is that they've got where they are because they're really, really good at what they do mm. and not because they're really good at managing people. Uh, and it can be quite a lonely place to be. So um, I've worked with people on issues such as succession planning, you know, when, when they feel they're on a hamster wheel and they're working incredibly hard and really long hours and paying loads of people's mortgages uh, and turning that dynamic around a bit so that your business is working for you rather than you working for your business is mm. the, generally the objective of that. You know, what do you need to get from this and what, what are your longer term goals? for your life and for your business how um, what's your path towards achieving them so working with individual leaders I've probably done um, a little bit more of mm. and and say something like uh, family succession succession planning within a practice what are the kind of obstacles in, in that because that's something that's come up a few times in our conversation I think architects and, find that in my experience many architects find that very difficult thinking about the succession planning some do it really well um, some do it less well. I mean, you know, obviously one of the things with architects is that an awful lot of them are called after people who no longer work within them. Mm. Um, so it shows that they're not really thinking of succession planning because the practice is still called after people that don't work there anymore. But, but succession planning is a really complex thing. And um, I think another a factor that certainly I've come across before is that um, lots of creative leaders, not just architects, but they appoint people who are just below their level of competence and they do it almost unconsciously because they think that what they're doing is succession planning but actually it's because they may find the challenge of having somebody working for them who is as good as them and has the potential to be as good as them actually quite 
challenging. We were talking about that this morning, weren't we? I think we've both we've both come across that's that fascinating. A bit. And I suppose it's one of those unaware emotional things that's kind of dictating the decisions, which and those are decisions that are going to shape the business they're going, they're going to shape the business and actually if you're getting to the stage in your life and in your career where you're thinking actually i need to think about an exit strategy in the next five or ten years um, but you still want to have some connection with your business then you clearly need people there who are going to be as good or better than you are so developing your emotional intelligence so that you can recognize those people and and um, play that role in their lives as uh, of nurturing and developing them to to one day, you know, step into a leadership role, the leadership role in your business, is is not an easy thing to do. And, and how can architects, say, for example, in in the hiring of staff, uh, make sure that they're employing people that have a high level of emotional intelligence? Because I've heard business leaders in the past speak to me or have conversations, and sometimes it's one of the things they really think is the most important is not necessarily what's on the CV, but actually the emotional intelligence of a particular a newcomer to a team. So how can architects uh, or business owners ensure that they're kind of bringing emotional intelligence to those kinds of HR processes? Well, I'm going to let Rachel answer that in just a minute, but I will say something that we feel, we both feel is really important, that by actually um, working with, with a more coaching approach to developing people, you may not have to do so much recruitment because we would really argue that retention is a much better strategy than mm. recruitment. It's cheaper. You don't get people setting up in competition to you. You know, we spoke, we both spoke to somebody quite recently who said, we have one of two things. They either leave and set up on their own or they leave because they haven't done that well here and then they go somewhere else and they flourish. Now, what's that about? And isn't that a waste of, of your human capital? That's a terribly cold term, but you know what I mean. You've invested all this time and energy and even money into somebody. And then they leave and set up on their own or go and work for somebody else and do really well. So we would both argue that actually um, developing a more coaching style approach to management may stop that happening in the first place. And I'll let Rachel talk about recruitment. First of all, what, 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 is, what does a coaching style mean? What does that mean to you? Well, I'm afraid it's words that we've used before, like listening right. <laughs> uh, and empathy right. and developing that most people go to work these days. They don't want to be somebody different from the person they are at home. They want a kind of congruence between who they are at home and who they are at work. They want to be accepted for what they bring to the table. They want to be they want to feel that they're being invested in, that they're that they're um, that their strengths and values are being honoured that they are part of a collaborative effort, that, that they've got some sense of purpose. Um, there is less disconnect now between people at work and people out of work. And I think that you know, modern um, recruitment and retention strategies need to take that into account. Mm. Yeah, I think just to add to that on the coaching style, um, there's a big shift in sort of leadership terms away from the old the sort of command and control. So person at the top of an organization dictating down and this sort of cascading of information down an organization um, into a position where actually leadership is much more distributed across or needs to be distributed across the practice. So when somebody comes to somebody, a principal of a practice and says, how shall I do this? It needs to be less about, or a coaching style is less about, you do it this way, mm. or try this, and more about, what have you tried so far? And um, the asking questions to try and get that person to actually resolve it themselves. Because if you can do that, then obviously you can get all of your people in the practice to um, resolve day-to-day -day issues much more directly themselves, and therefore less pressure on these busy principles of... Um, practices. Mm. Yeah. Um, back on the other question. Yes, on the on the on the <laughs> HR. On uh, the, how so, can on, on the how can architects try and employ people with high emotional intelligence? I think that's quite difficult. Um, so I would start with improving the emotional intelligence of the people doing the recruitment in the ways that we said. Because if you've got low emotional intelligence, you won't recognise it in other people. In fact, worse than that. I think you'll actually then recruit lots of clones 
of yourself. And you can kind of see it in organizations who have people leading recruitment with low emotional intelligence. They just have a team of people who are all just like them. Mm. Whereas people with higher emotional intelligence, I think, are able to understand their own strengths and not worry too much about their weaknesses. They might be working on those things, but they're not worried about other people having that strength. They're not threatened by that in some way. So yeah, I would work on principles and those recruiting, improving their own first. Fascinating, thank you very much. If, if any architects listening to this wanting to get in touch or wanting to, to work with you, where do they start? Uh, well, we both have websites. So rbmarketing.co.uk And uh, my website is idea.co.uk and that's spelt E-I-D-Y-I-A. Brilliant. I'll put all the information in the link below. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you for listening. Now, don't forget, early bird tickets are now on sale for the next BOA UK live event which is the seven threats to an architectural practice happening Tuesday, 5th of March, 2019. Book your tickets now. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.